What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to yet another video. Today, we're going to be checking out the rise and fall of Ultimate Spider-Man by Alex Lennon. Now, we've watched a few Alex Lennon videos. We watched the entire history of Batman by Alex Lennon, um, the entire history of Spider-Man, and also Superior Spider-Man, which was the comic book line where Doc Ock goes into the body of Peter Parker and becomes Spider-Man. That had a lot of potential. Now, I didn't like what they did with some of the characters. I also didn't like the ending. There was some writing flaws there, but I feel like that had a lot of potential to be like really good. Now, I don't know if they've revisited that comic book line before, like recently, but they need to because I feel like nowadays people have like a little bit of an appreciation of it, but they recognize the flaws. Like everybody sees the flaws in it, right? But I think people are just like, you know what? This could have been something great. Anyways, with that being said, we're going to be moving on to Ultimate Spider-Man. Now, Ultimate Spider-Man... Just like the last two, I, I know nothing about. Now, I think Miles Morales does appear in Ultimate Spider-Man, so I do know that. Um, I think he appears like in the middle of it. I think, I think. I might be wrong. That might be a different comic book line, but I think it is Ultimate Spider-Man. But we're going to find out, guys. And Miles Morales is my favorite superhero of all time. So I'm super, super excited to see if he's in this. If he is, thumbs up. Hit that like button if you enjoyed this video. Shouts out to Alex Lennon. Please check out all of their videos. Links will be in the description down below to their channel and also the video that we're watching today. And on top of that, subscribe if you're new. Let's jump into it. All right, guys. Shouts out to Alex Lennon once again. Here it is. Ultimate Spider-Man. In the late 1990s, Marvel were broke. Sales Ooh. had declined, they were heavily in debt, and they eventually had to file for bankruptcy. Ooh. In terms of Spider-Man's... Didn't that happen to them in the 2000s also? Isn't that how Disney acquired them? Like, didn't Marvel file for bankruptcy and they needed a company to save them? And Disney was like, hey, we'll buy you guys. And they did. Specifically, I thought that's what they happened. just finished this massive, overly complicated storyline that had left even the most loyal of fans uninterested to keep reading. And so, Marvel Apparently. said, screw it. We'll start again. A brand new series, starting from issue one, that would reimagine Spider-Man's origin story for a new generation. Oh, they yay. They called it Spider-Man Chapter One. You oh, see, Marvel have always creative. been a bit lenient with their continuity, meaning that certain topical events can be subject to change. If the Punisher's getting too old to have served in Vietnam, they'll change it so he fought in Afghanistan instead. Sure, okay. the story still works, Modernizing. just don't think about it too hard. Thus, Marvel yeah. sought to do the same with Spider-Man, to update his history while still allowing it to make sense in the original timeline. This, however, created a problem. Because it had to fit into the timeline, because it was bound by these old stories, it couldn't distinguish itself enough from the original comics. Like, oh. the story's the exact same, but he gets a computer instead of a microscope. Like, yeah, <laughs> real groundbreaking stuff, mate. In fact, because it was so desperately trying to justify its own existence, it made pointless changes that actually detracted from the original. Like, instead of Peter being poor because of his class, you know, a fundamental aspect of his character, it's now because Aunt May likes to go on spending sprees and uses rent money to buy presents. The I mean, that's kind of valid, though. I mean, that is a mental health issue. I have friends who go to therapy because they have shopping addictions. So, yeah, I, f I feel like that's all right. I mean, does it need to be a change? Nah, not really, but it's an acceptable change. I don't think that was like an unacceptable one. It makes sense. You know, I've seen families go bankrupt because they have a parent that is spending all of the money. But yeah, I get what he means, though. It is kind of like one of those things where it's like, why would you change that? Like, what? what's the point? But hey, I guess it was to give Aunt May a little bit more character instead of them just being like, hey, we're poor. Uh, that we just we're poor because we're poor. They wanted to give them like a reason. I don't know. The series ended up a disappointment. It's not like it bombed or anything, but it wasn't the big thing Marvel needed. This soft reboot was soon forgotten and left Marvel wary to do anything like this ever again. Mm. until they did it again. Around the turn <laughs> of the century, the big boys at Marvel knew they needed a hit, and so they looked at what chapter one got wrong and used what they'd learned to their advantage. This Smart. time, they weren't just going to do a simple retelling, but more a complete reinvention. A whole new separate universe, no convoluted lore, no having to abide by other stories, a perfect jumping on point. I love that already. No convoluted lore. Perfect. I am tuned in. Just from hearing that, I'm tuned in. I'm ready to go. I'm strapped in. Hey, Marvel. I'm buying this line. Like, hey, the suit looks good here, by the way. For old fans and new like readers the alike. To bring this project to life, Marvel recruited independent writer Brian Michael Bendis and paired him with veteran comics artist Mark Bagley. Soon, the two got to work reinventing Spider-Man for the new millennium. 
The first issue followed a young Peter Parker as he struggled to survive high school, often Looks ending good. up the target of bullies and being ruthlessly assaulted in the corridors for no reason. When school ended, he'd seek refuge in his family home, surrounded by his loving parent figures, Aunt May and Uncle Ben. One of the first proper changes to the origin story was the inclusion of MJ and Harry. In the original mm. comics, Peter met them in college, in college, and their friendship developed throughout his young adult life. In Ultimate Spider-Man, however, they're friends at school and are implied to have known each other for a long time. Ben? And that's what I'm familiar with. That's the MJ and Harry that I'm familiar with, that they knew each other since, you know, childhood kind of thing. They were, they've been childhood friends and... MJ and Peter end up kind of going like, hey, we've been childhood friends and she knows everything about me. So I'm going to start dating her now. Yay. You know what I mean? So, yeah, this is what I grew up with. This is the Spider-Man that I'm familiar with. So Ultimate Spider-Man seems like the one that I have seen a lot, like in the 2000s and up. This also borrowed the changes from chapter one that worked, such as Doc Ock being involved with the spider bite and the presence of Norman Osborn behind the scenes. But I'd say the largest difference mm. between the original and ultimate version is pace. Bendis being Bendis took Spider-Man's 11 page origin story and stretched it to just over 130 pages. Whoa. Half the time there isn't even Hilder. a plot. I mean Aunt May baking Peter some banana bread isn't exactly integral to the story, but these kind of right. scenes work to establish dynamics between the characters, round out their personalities, and just let you spend time with them. Take Uncle Ben for example. In the original comic he shows up Dad, for quit. no more than a few panels and then right. dies two seconds later. This new Uncle Ben has more of a presence. He's a bit of a smart ass, you know, he likes to tell the odd joke now and again. He's got a tough but fair attitude, he's clearly invested in his nephew's life and only mm. wants what's best for him. He's around for so long that by the time you get to issue four you almost forget he's gonna get executed in his own home. It's here that- And I like that. Sometimes you need a build up. Sometimes you need to build up the characters for the reader to actually care and get invested in them, right? Like one of my favorite games is Trails in the Sky. Highly recommend that everyone here watching this video plays it, by the way. That game has the slowest build up of all time, right? But not only is it building up the characters, but it's also building up the world and it does it phenomenally. Like if you can sit there and read that dialogue and get through it, Trust me, you're in for a freaking ride because, yeah, the beginning is a little boring. Eh, it is what it is. But when you get to the middle, oh, man, it starts to pick up. And when you hit that ending, the payoff is beautiful. And that's just the first game, by the way. The payoff at the end of the first game, I felt like I lost my best friend. Like, <laughs> Not saying that anyone dies or anything like that, but I'm just saying I was so invested in the characters that... I didn't want to see anyone go. You know what I mean? I was like, man, you guys are my best friends. Like, I know everything about you at this point. Like, we've been sitting here playing this game for 60, 70, 80 hours. And I've been reading all this dialogue and doing all of these side quests and stuff. And I know about y'all's childhood. I know about the teenage years. Like, it just felt so good at the end. And I cried. I literally cried because, you know, it was just such a perfectly told story. And it picks up in the next game. And they just keep going. And sometimes you need that, man, to get people invested in the story. And that's okay. You know, filler's good. If you know how to write good filler, A, Aunt May cooking or baking banana bread could be the reason why somebody cries later. I don't know. Like, hey. <laughs> Bendis' style of storytelling really works in his favour. This early stuff, while it does feel like it's poking around a bit, works to enrich the more dramatic moments later on. Scale, spectacle, that's all fine, but if you want the story to really stick with you, you have to care. And you can only care if you had that investment in the first place. So mm -hmm. Peter stops his uncle's killer and Agreed. learns that with great power comes great responsibility, blah blah blah, we're all used We've to it been there, now. done that. What people might not realise, however, is that this lesson of power and responsibility is the exact opposite lesson of the original comics. Uh -oh. In Lee and Ditko's original story, Peter starts off as this arrogant victim of society who only cares about his aunt and uncle. Right. His selfish traits are made worse when he gets his powers. And so so when Uncle Ben dies and Peter is humbled, he makes a conscious choice to change who he is as a person. Yeah, he kind of sucks Peter, in the beginning. It's a different case. 
while this Peter can still be a dick and lash out at people, he starts off a little bit more thoughtful and empathetic. He doesn't just care about his aunt and uncle, he's got Harry and Mary Jane. He's willing right. to make peace with his bullies. When Norman Osborn sends an assassin to run him over, Peter doesn't even think of himself. His first instinct is to see if the assassin is okay. But he's this completely Peter already selfless. has what he needs from the get-go, but when he gets bit by the spider and gets used to his new powers, he starts to become someone else. He starts Uh-oh. playing sports, he goes to parties, he starts Uh-oh. chasing money and fame with an amateur wrestling career, even though he admits <laughs> to himself. Okay, so that's where the wrestling came from, because I was... When we were watching the history of Spider-Man and we were also watching the superior Spider-Man, I was like, what happened to the wrestling thing that I saw in the very first Spider-Man movie with Tobey Maguire, where he was an amateur wrestler trying to make money for Aunt May and Uncle Ben, right? What happened to that? And apparently it's here. Elf <laughs> that he doesn't want to do it. After Uncle Ben dies, Peter's lesson isn't to change who he is as a person, it's to hold on to who he was in the first place in this new, ever-changing world. When he goes off and fights the Green Goblin for the first time, he's reclaiming his old self and fulfilling Uncle Ben's belief in him. These first few issues were a massive success. They weren't record-breaking, but both critical and financial reception was strong. I and bet. gave Marvel the assurance that whatever Bendis and Bagley were doing, it was working. The series continued on its path, introducing familiar faces like Electro, Sandman, and Shocker, each of whom hmm. had been redesigned to be less campy They're and cool. more suitable for the early 2000s aesthetic. In other words, they either dressed them in black or made them naked. And the they're ripped. That followed, the series focused on Peter's grief. After Uncle Ben dies, Peter doesn't seem to care. Sure, there's the initial outburst, but after the killer gets turned in, he's totally fine. He works on his web. But it might hit him later. And that's the thing. Like right now, it's cool. I have web shooters. I do this. I do that. But something's going to happen that's going to flip that switch where he's like, wait, my Uncle Ben died. That sucks. It, that has to happen. Web shooters, he's cheery at school. And it's like, Peter, your father figure is lying dead in the dirt and right. you're jumping for joy in your underwear. <laughs> As the comic goes on, it becomes clear that this passiveness is just a coping mechanism. He right. can't hold there back his grief for long, and so he starts sharing his dreams with ghosts. So, what does he do? And they wrote he it, cool. Things right. He does a background check on Uncle Ben's killer, which leads him to the kingpin of organized crime. Over these oh. next couple issues, Peter is develops an obsession with kingpin and vows to bring him to justice. This rivalry is really just Peter's way of dealing with grief, his attempt to fix the world to let his uncle die. But it doesn't mm. work that way. You can't solve your pain by directing it externally, and Kingpin eventually finds a way to escape. Even when Peter has him dead to rights, there's always some legal loophole that gets him out of it. It's clear that in order to stop Kingpin and get through his grief, he's got a lot more work to do, both inside and out. To make Peter's life even harder, the Green Goblin returns and beats the shit out of him. Holy crap, that design for the Green Goblin is insane! Look at him! Let's talk about this panel, first of all. The colors look amazing. And the way that the Green Goblin is just strangling Peter right here. Oh, this is beautiful. This is probably my favorite design of the Green Goblin because it's not just a man in a goblin suit. He actually... It, well, from what I'm gathering here, he turns into a goblin-like creature. His reputation is ruined after a Spider-Man copycat starts robbing banks, and to top it all off, Venom is born. There are some instances oh. where the slow pace is maybe a bit too much. There's a whole issue dedicated to Spider-Man and Dr. Octopus on a plane, and Dr. Octopus is like, hmm, you're probably wondering how we got on this plane, and then it cuts to 11 pages explaining how they got on the plane, and <laughs> knocking Spider-Man out, then running away from S.H.I.E.L.D. agents, and then well, that's the cool. car, and then they go steal a plane. I like that. And, oh, they used Explain Rockefeller it. airfields? Oh, I would have lost sleep over that one. That yeah, okay, that's kind of lame. But like I said before, this slow pace works, for the most part, to get you to care about the characters. Exactly. Because despite the adventures being a bit wacky, the characters characters always remain grounded, they feel like real people. From the way he talks and acts, Ultimate Peter genuinely feels as if a real teenager got superpowers. Mm. Much like his 616 counterpart, this Peter is very susceptible to public opinion, and all the bad press really gets in his head. He suffers from self-doubt, thinking maybe the world is right about him and he's not suited to be a hero. The only way he can get around this is by not listening to the world, by shutting himself off from outside opinions, and having the courage to identify his own self-worth. To do what's- There you go. To do what you think is right. There you go, Peter. Don't listen to the people around you. That's kind of relatable. Not gonna lie. Don't a lot of content creators go through this, by the way? Like, it's relatable to a lot of content creators. Right? No matter what people think of him. Right. This is a character arc that is so prevalent in every piece of Spider-Man media. Comics, movies, TV shows, games. That's why I love him. Overcoming self-doubt is so mm -hmm. key to the character, and Ultimate gets it right. 
This Peter also has a temper, reminiscent of the later Stan Lee stuff where he'd just be pissed off all the time. I think having this long term rage is another vital aspect of the character, although Ultimate Peter will just get pissed off at literally anyone. His <laughs> friends, family, teachers, bullies, enemies, the X-Men, Nick Fury. There is not one person he won't act- I think that's fair. He's a teenager. He's gonna go off on his friends and stuff like that and other people because, you know, especially since he was bullied at one point, you know? And now he has powers and he's just like, hey, like, leave me the freak alone. Like, you know what I mean? He's going to have anger issues. He's going through puberty. Aggravate or insult or tilt off themselves. This is another flaw <laughs> that gets in the way. Him losing his cool can cause relationships to break down or him losing out on opportunities or harming his reputation. I like it's a that. selfish impulse he must learn to control if he right. wants to improve as a superhero. But despite all his flaws, Ultimate Peter is still a caring, courageous young man who's in over his head, which at the end of the day is what Spider-Man's all about. Any flaws he does have are challenged by his supporting cast, who are also well-developed characters in their own right. Ooh, in the first couple good. issues, Mary Jane is not Mary Jane. She's another character wearing a Mary Jane skin suit. What? Where 616 MJ was this happy-go-lucky party girl, independent of male attention, Ultimate MJ is a slightly unpopular bookworm who gets jealous easily and is super awkward when it comes to romance. Well, that's valid. She's younger here. She's like in high school, right? They're all in high school. They're all teenagers. So yeah, she's not going to be the hot party girl. She hasn't gone through college yet. <laughs> On a surface level, the two couldn't be further apart. But as the series progresses, MJ's core traits start to emerge. Like mm. 616 MJ, she proves time and time again why they're so perfect for each other. She supports Peter through his grief, providing the strength and stability he needs to get through these dark times. Their love is pure and unconditional, they match each other's energy, and they both understand each other like no one else can. What makes MJ and stand out from Peter's other love interests is how she's meant to test Peter's pride. In Ultimate Spider-Man, their relationship is often brought down by Peter's sense of responsibility. Him saying, oh, but I can't be with you because you'll get hurt and I have to protect you and such and such. While he may have a point, this self-righteousness often leads him to neglect MJ and ignore her own autonomy. She has to prove him wrong, challenge his idea of responsibility, and make him realize that he needs her just as much as she needs him. I think that's Ultimate You know, that's true. And it's very relatable. Like being a content creator can be kind of similar. Like when you have relationships and such, um, you know, you're so involved in your work and you're basically like, yeah, I have this girlfriend or this significant other, but like, I don't have time for you, blah, blah, blah. blah. And they're like, hey, but I want to be with you. And you're just like, well, I, I'm so busy and stuff like that. And they're like, but it's okay. We'll find time. You know, I want to be with you. And I can definitely relate to that, Peter. It happens. Spider-Man's biggest strength. Taking the original cast, putting them in a different environment with different personalities, but still keeping the heart of the characters alive. Aunt May starts off as this kind, caring old lady who we're supposed to take pity on, but over time okay. we get to see her underlying strength. Because while Peter got his sense of responsibility from Uncle Ben, he got his indomitable willpower from Aunt May. Flash Thompson doesn't get to do much in Ultimate, but that's because his traditional arc is passed on to Kenny. Like Flash from the original comics, Kenny gives Peter a hard time, but is slowly inspired by Spider-Man to be a better person. Eventually he becomes a friend to Peter, and even becomes a hero in his own right. Gwen, despite being what? completely different from her original counterpart, still ends up playing the same role. She just ends up in the wrong place at the wrong time, and her death serves to teach Peter that sometimes tragedy- She dies horrifically! Did you just see her right there? What happens to her? What happened to Gwen? Hello? She just ends up in the wrong place at the wrong time, and her death serves to teach Peter that sometimes tragedy strikes for no reason, and you can't let it undermine the good still left in your life. Around the right. issue 70 mark, Peter's getting used to being a superhero, and the price that comes with this kind of life. He's seen death up close more times than he can handle, and it's really getting to him. Peter's two identities go hand in hand, and one doesn't work without the other. Spider-Man is an opportunity for Peter to mature. It's this admirable, heroic version of himself that he must live up to in his day-to-day -day life. The feats he overcomes as Spider-Man allow him to develop who he is as Peter Parker. But it also goes the other way. If Peter doesn't have his shit figured out, if he has unresolved trauma and anger and drama in his personal life, the quality of his heroics suffers. 
Throughout mm. these later stories, there's a very obvious theme of rebellion. The younger generation rising up against the old in order to create a better future for themselves, something that was a huge part of Stanley's original books. Now, Stanley was making Spider-Man during the counterculture movement of the 60s and early 70s. He was concerned with the issues of that time period, because that's what was shaping his young readers' lives at the time. While well, Ultimate like takes place almost 40 years later and instead focuses on a post-9-11 America, yeah. the main idea is still the same. Whether it's the heightened security and surveillance in the form of S.H.I.E.L.D., or rich guys like Norman Osborn or the Kingpin who profit off conflict. Whether it's J. Jonah Jameson who creates fear in the press, taking these complex issues and turning them into stories about good guys and bad guys because it sells papers. Peter's responsibility is not just to save people and do the right thing, but also be the voice of his generation. To stand up when no one else can, and use his powers to create positive change in a world that fights against them. In the original comics, go. Peter had the Fantastic Four and the Avengers to look up to. They were the good guys, fighting for a better world, and it was Peter's aim to join them when he was ready. In the Ultimate Universe, however, Peter is largely alone. The Ultimates are a government police force, they strive to protect the status quo rather than change it, and on top of that they're just a bunch of dickheads. On the rare occasion <laughs> they do interact with Peter, they talk down to him, treating his adventures as kid stuff. The Fantastic Four are also with the government, and sure they- I mean, it makes sense though, he is a teenager, but at the same time, that gives him uh, the opportunity to prove everyone wrong, right? Because it's like, haha, you're just the small teenage boy, what are you gonna do, right? And now Peter's like, hey, but guess what, I'm gonna show you that I'm supposed to be the hero. That I am strong enough to probably be better than y'all. Screw the Fantastic Four. Screw the Avengers. I don't need y'all. <laughs> might seem promising at first, but that kind of falls apart when one of them becomes a mass murderer. You have the uh -huh. X-Men, who have good intentions for the most part, but they seem to cause Peter far more trouble than they do help him. The only exception is Nick Fury, who hypes Peter up, recognises his gifts, but he's also waiting until Peter turns 18 so he can join S.H.I.E.L.D.'s paramilitary death squad. The ultimate Yikes. superhero world is just another part of the old establishment that Peter must rise above. There's no standard to base his actualization on, so he must set the standard himself. The series is not at all subtle in its messaging. Half the time characters will just monologue the moral of the story right in your face. But that's <laughs> the way Spider-Man's always delivered messages. Around right. issue 100, the series was still doing pretty well. We got the Clone Saga, a reimagining of oh, that really long, overly complicated storyline from the 90s, which brought Gwen Stacy back from the dead and introduced the character of Spider-Woman. At this point, Peter was dating Kitty Pryde, a member of the X-Men. This was a fresh what? new idea. Their relationship was really well written and they had good chemistry and it was all good and nice and wholesome. And then, during the Clone Saga, he cheats on her, forgets to break up with her, and gives her a half-assed apology afterwards. What the hell? Oh! But you know what? He is a teenager and things like this do happen. All right. But will he learn from this? We're about to find out. Spider-Man, don't get me wrong. 616 Peter isn't exactly the most perfect person when it comes to relationships. He's led people yeah. on before. He's been a bit yeah, of a But he's never outright betrayed anyone in his own relationship. He's generally respectful when it comes to that sort of thing, because his loyalty is one of his strengths as a character. Now, I'm not a massive believer in comic accuracy. I think the artists should be able to do their own thing and not be tied down by past interpretations of the character they're adapting. Hey, but he's young though. Come on now. And it happens. Like, hey, relationships are hard. Yeah, is he a hero? Yeah, do people look up to him? Absolutely. Is he a kind person? Yeah. Is he a good person overall? Absolutely. Peter Parker's awesome. But guess what? He's not the best when it comes to relationships and he's got to learn and he's got to grow from this. However, if you're not going to retain the core values associated with that character, why use that character in the first place? I guess the saving grace of this is that Peter is never rewarded for his behaviour. He acknowledges that he is a two-timer and that he does feel really guilty. That's good. His apology is not well executed at all. Oh, but that's I not good. chalk up to teenage awkwardness. Yeah. And besides, he's forced to suffer the consequences for a long time. Peter is meant to be selfish and neglect his loved ones, perhaps not to this extent, but it's these kind of mistakes that let him mature as a person and mm -hmm. allow him to forgive himself. So right. we'll give him a pass so long as he learns his lesson. He does, does learn he? his lesson, right? Aww. Okay, so Peter's a bit of a bitch, but he makes up for it in the next story arc, in which oh. he finally stops the Kingpin. Not by trying to get revenge, or using brute force, or telling fat jokes, but by looking inside his own soul. Daredevil wants revenge, and threatens Kingpin's wife, only for Peter to talk him out of it. Having largely processed the death of Uncle Ben, Peter's able to come full circle, and use what he learned to stop Daredevil from making the same mistake. With this, Kingpin is finally defeated, and meets the justice he'd managed to avoid for the past hundred issues. 
I also love the complete 180 Kingpin does. He's like, oh yeah, 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 I'll, I'll do whatever you say, Mr. Spider-Man, just, just please don't hurt my wife. And then the millisecond they <laughs> leave him alone, he's like, I'm gonna blow up Spider-Man's school with all the children in it. Even his henchmen oh is God. like, what? And then they get arrested anyway. These final arcs are what I would consider to be the tail end of Ultimate's golden age. Mark Bagley had said goodbye to the series and had passed the reins on to Stuart Imminent. Series-long conflicts were being resolved left and right, and the comic was building to its natural conclusion. In one of my older, terrible videos, I spoke at length about Ultimatum, the big crossover event at the end of the first volume and the impact that it had on the characters. But what I really didn't focus on was the events that led to it. Everything starts off completely normal. Human Torch is fighting the Vulture and teams up with Spider-Woman, all while Peter and MJ are having a gay old time. The next day, Peter and his friends meet outside his house, excited to have a break from all the superhero stuff and just be teenagers for a while. On the surface, this is just a nice, wholesome scene. But if you read this knowing what's about to happen next, it's rather unsettling. Uh -oh. Seeing these characters completely oblivious of what's to come, happily heading into mortal danger and they don't know it. Aunt May even throws in a friendly reminder to take shelter if it rains. Once oh, Peter no. and company have left, things start to take a turn. The police arrive, and Aunt May is arrested for her connection to Spider-Man. As she is taken away from her what? home, the colour starts to drain from the panels, and the weather slowly starts to change. Over the next issue, the pressure on Aunt May keeps building and building, and then suddenly... Darkness. The officers go to investigate, and Aunt May creeps out into the light, finally revealing New York completely Holy. destroyed by a massive, cold and uncaring tidal wave. I think the reason this tie-in works so much better than the main event itself comes down to a matter of perspective. Ultimate Spider-Man does what Spider-Man does best, which is providing a voice for the little guy, the everyman. While the main event is played out on this massive scale where everything is grand and bold and epic, Bendis shows what it's like for the people on the ground. It's a purposely narrow, human perspective, where everyone has no idea what the hell's going on, and they're just trying to do the best they can in a dire situation. That is it feels so less interesting. pessimistic edginess and more like hope persisting amid tragedy. Also, it probably helps that the uh, main event is dog shit, and literally anything else Aww. would have been better anyways. Despite Peter's best efforts, the number of people he saves is far outweighed by the number of dead. It's not long before he himself is lost in all the chaos, and he is presumed dead in the aftermath of the wave. It's here people get- What? Uh huh? Thrown off because the series just ends. There's no real what? indication where you're supposed to go next. It leads to a lot of people being like, is that it? He gets caught in a random explosion and just- dies without realizing that there's two more issues separate from the main run. Oh. Despite feeling a bit all over the place at times, the first volume of Ultimate Spider-Man can be viewed as one solid arc. You start off with this young man whose life changes drastically and he enters this new, exciting world. As he crosses further and further into this world, he leaves his old world behind and fights to build a better one for himself and others. In the second act, he goes through trial after trial, pushing him to his limit. He's tempted to give it all up and take the easy way out, but he persists, he gets through it, and comes out the other side a more competent hero. Then in Act 3, he finds balance between his outer and inner worlds, and is mostly freed from the demons who've tortured him in the past. He mm. then must prove his new understanding by passing on what he's learned to others in need of help. As J. Jonah Jameson writes Spider-Man's obituary, he cements Peter as the standard for others to look up to. Peter's sacrifice unites the older generation with the new, inspiring them to stop fighting against change and rebuild a better world together. But the story of Spider-Man is never meant to be a tragedy. Despite how bad things get, there's always that optimism, that glimmer of hope. And as Peter is found in the wreckage and opens his eyes, that hope is restored. And then something weird happened. What? The series took a break for a bit and returned oh, with a no! brand new issue one. We were presented with a time skip of six months, in which New York has been magically rebuilt and everything's back <laughs> to normal. Well, I say normal, but Peter has mysteriously broken up with MJ yet again and is now dating Gwen. Again? This is a bit weird, given that there's been multiple times where both Peter and Gwen have likened each other to siblings. Like, multiple times. Like, they really hammered that home. Now, all of a sudden, they're ma She's like my little sister. Oh, no. She's kind of like my sister. So what, is she your girl? No. Why? Why they're they have siblings. to write it like, like this? Like multiple times, like they really hammered that home. Now all of a sudden they're making out in the attic and the reason they got together in the first place is never really explored. I think oh, what bothers God. people about the second volume, aside from the style change and you know, that, is that it was just getting a bit old. I've always said that change is a key element of Spider-Man, how Peter goes through different stages of his life and grows as a person. This new volume showed no signs that Peter had matured during the six months he'd been away. In fact, his maturity seemed to have regressed with oh, the way he was handling good. the whole MJ Gwen situation. Right. By now, the comic was almost a decade old and was caught up in its own status quo it had originally been created to avoid. 
There was some good stuff in there, but it was more of the same good stuff we'd gotten before. I guess while Peter himself doesn't get much development in this second volume, it more shows how Spider-Man as a concept can develop other people. Aunt May adopts the Human Torch and Iceman so they can have stable lives, Kenny rises up to protect Kitty from discrimination, and J. Jonah Jameson continues his mission to clear Spider-Man's name, after witnessing his heroics in Ultimatum. This new volume was short-lived, and ended with the story arc, Death of Spider-Man. While it perhaps didn't get the build-up it deserved, the arc itself is nothing short of amazing. After really? making his end at the hands of the Green Goblin, Peter dies surrounded by his friends and family, <gasps> satisfied with the knowledge that he kept them all safe. It's oh. executed beautifully and sincerely, and is an almost perfect send-off to a character that had been around for a decade. My favourite part isn't even the story itself, but the impact it had on the Ultimate Universe. Bendis has spent his time building up this supporting cast, building this world, and so to see everyone reacting to Peter's death, it feels like a payoff. The tears are earned. Bendis killed off Peter for two main reasons, one being because he could, because it was the Ultimate Universe, where you could get away with that sort of thing, and such a death would be genuinely shocking and heartfelt. The other reason, of course, was Miles. Bendis didn't yeah! want Miles having to compete with Peter, he wanted him to be his own thing, and in order for it to really work, Peter had to go. I've seen people say that Miles is just Peter but boring, and I get that to an extent. This first version of Miles is not nearly as ch BORING! Okay, well, but- oh, 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 right. We're, we're, we're gonna see about that pretty soon here. I need to see what the comic book line is like, but I like the PlayStation uh, interpretation of Miles. Charming or as well-rounded as his Spider-Verse counterpart, but I think to dismiss him entirely would be unfair. When right. Uncle Ben dies, Peter vows to be a hero and to never let anyone come to harm under his watch. But Miles, he's like, fuck that. Miles is kind-hearted, he's got the right intentions, and he loves the short-term thrill of having superpowers. But the weight of Peter Parker's legacy is too much on him. His unwillingness to act doesn't come from arrogance, but fear. He confides right. in his best friend, not out of love, but of desperation. Spider-Man as a symbol has skyrocketed in the wake of Peter's death. He is celebrated by millions, the superhero world has been reshaped by his final acts. And what, Miles is just supposed to be this symbol? Miles initially overcomes mm. this fear and becomes the new Spider-Man, but it's not that simple. He's just trying to prove himself to a world that wants him to be Peter Parker. He's going against his personality and doesn't have a proper understanding of what Spider-Man means, aside from the superficial stuff. Every solution to his problems boils down to either, hmm, what would Peter Parker do? Or he just uses his Venom Blast and wins instantly. This isn't <laughs> helped by the fact that Miles has no real mentor. While Peter's uncle wanted him to expand his worldview, Miles' uncle wants the opposite. When he discovers Miles' abilities, he tries to corrupt his nephew, leading to a conflict that gets him killed. Yeah. In death, Aaron is a mirror for Miles. He too had gifts, he was brilliant in his own way, but he never did anything with it. Instead of rising above Aaron's example and proving his uncle wrong, Miles takes it the wrong way. He takes Aaron's death as yet another reason why he's not suited to be Spider-Man. Then he's thrown into a massive superhero war, barely survives, and before he gets the chance to rest, Venom shows up. Yeah, in what? hindsight they could have used a better spelling for this one. In a devastating Rawr. battle that takes the life of his mother, Miles loses it and quits being Spider-Man for an entire year. His guilt has gotten the better of him and he wants nothing to do with being a superhero, ignoring those who try and talk him back into it. Even when he's in- I mean, I, I think this is kind of interesting and it makes sense. Like, imagine you having to fill the shoes of someone else before you, you know, and he's struggling with that. And he continues to struggle with that and he can't find his own footing in it. And I think that's not just, I don't think, I don't find that boring. I don't find that boring at all. I don't know why people found it boring. I think, I think that's kind of interesting. Up. Yeah, in hindsight, they could have used a better spelling for this one. In a devastating battle that takes the life of his mother, Miles loses it and quits being his mom dies? for an entire year. His guilt has gotten the better of him, and he wants nothing to do with being a superhero, ignoring those who try and talk him back into it. Even when he's in the center of danger, he does the absolute bare minimum and lets other people handle it. It's only when Spider-Woman gives him a long, heartfelt speech that he finally listens. Jessica is a female clone of Peter, with all of Peter's memories. She struggled with her sense of self-image, at first unable to see herself as more than just an echo, but she eventually carved out her own identity. She's similar to Miles in that she never asked for any of this, except she's got mm. over herself and is doing everything she can to help. Jessica is the proof Miles needs to get back up, proof that he doesn't have to let his guilt nor anyone's expectations define him. Jessica isn't forcing him to do anything, she's just supporting Miles' own decision. With all of this, 
Miles finds his purpose and is finally able is. to take ownership of his secret identity. I love it. He's being Spider-Man, not as an answer to other people, but as a duty to himself. To himself. There will always be a Spider-Man because it's such a natural response to evil. Compassion, perseverance, bravery. These traits aren't created in a lab. They don't require anything but a good heart. These men of science who try and corrupt nature, these people who try and oppress and take away freedoms, they are nothing compared to the purity of the human spirit. Take one person away, it doesn't matter. The vacuum will always be filled because the symbol of good nature extends beyond any one individual. Miles' right. initial story isn't groundbreaking or anything, but it still carries forward all of the values Spider-Man's supposed to represent. And, that's and as he perfect. stands triumphant at the end of his first run, he's proof that these values will live on, no matter how hard some may try to repress them. After Miles' first volume, we got another crossover. Big end of the world stuff, don't worry about it. And then the series was relaunched yet again with Miles Morales, the ultimate Spider-Man. Uh -oh. This one makes me want to eat my own shoe. Uh -oh. Firstly, Peter Parker comes back out of nowhere, which oh, not no. only undermines his sacrifice, but is also never elaborated on because oh, he just crap. fucks off after a few issues. Ah. The story feels like it's prioritizing mystery and spectacle and, oh, look, Peter Parker's back over like actual story. It definitely has a lot of potential, but it's squandered by the fact that these setups never have satisfying payoffs. Characters are killed off randomly, which is not oh, exactly a man. new thing, but these deaths don't serve to teach the other characters anything. They just happen- oh, bro, I don't want to hear this. Come on. That line that they showed before this of Miles was pretty good. Like it was solid. Like that's something that, you know, it, it feels still Spider-Man. And I love it. It didn't change too much. You know, when people are saying, oh, it's boring. Oh, okay, yeah, but it's Spider-Man. And on top of that, he has a new issue that he has to um, resolve, right? Which is filling in the shoes of Peter Parker. It's like, well, do I go and be like this other guy? Where, where do I fit in? You know what I mean? No. And then he finds himself in it, right? He has Spider-Woman. She talks to him and he figures it all out. That's amazing. End of story. <laughs> Let's leave it at that, bro. I like it. It's cool. Uh for the sake of shock value. Oh, it's J. Jonah Jameson. I like him. Yeah, I like this character arc. Can't wait to see what they do with him next. Oh, oh he's dead. His head got incinerated. Oh. Huh. The reason these Beautiful. deaths don't work, and really the whole story for that matter, is down to a lack of weight. Ultimate Spider-Man used to be grounded. It used to prioritize real investment and emotional weight over scalar spectacle. Now, this looks like shock value. Opposite. This wasn't a problem exclusive to this volume either. The symptoms had been showing for a while now. As mm. time passed since its beginning, the series had introduced these increasingly convoluted plot lines and opportunities oh. to undo what had come before. Its groundedness was being slowly chipped away with each death and res- Do y'all remember the beginning of the video where Marvel was talking about how they wanted to make something that wasn't convoluted lore-wise? <laughs> what happened to that? What happened to that? And I told you guys, that's why I'm strapped in. I'm ready to go. I like stuff like that. What happened? Time passed since its beginning, the series had introduced these increasingly convoluted plot lines and opportunities to undo what had come before. Its groundedness was being slowly chipped away with each death uh, and resurrection and magical uh, time skip. Decisions seemed like they were made for the sake of drama rather than what go. the characters would actually do. Then there was a real opportunity to re-establish this weight, but it was eventually wasted. <sighs> it gets to the point where the story feels weightless. Osborne is resurrected for the zillionth time, oh Peter is revealed God. to be immortal, and then at oh. the end they crank it up to 11, when Miles is thrown into Earth 616 and his entire personal history is rewritten. His oh, turn is it off. Alive, his uncle is still alive, and the only thing that remains dead is my investment in the series. Again, that's not to Me say too. there's not good stuff in there. There are some great moments, the themes are carried through, through, but as a whole, it just feels. But it doesn't static. matter. Ultimate Spider-Man right. was now just another comic book with your typical comic book deaths and your typical comic book plot twists. I can appreciate that some of this probably wasn't Bendis' intention. I can imagine him getting a phone call from Marvel, being like, "Yeah, your universe is getting blown up in like five minutes. Good luck trying to finish all your plot lines." But that's just speculation. Maybe. I hate to end on a low note. So what I will say is that. As a whole, Ultimate Spider-Man has far more good than bad. Even the parts that were disappointing served as a blueprint for some of the best Spider-Man stories we've had in a long time. And True. regardless of your own opinion, I think we can all agree that it's better than whatever the fuck they're doing now. Oh no. What are they doing now? What are they doing now, Alex? I need to know what they're doing now. Oh no. Oh no. Oh, so you're telling me that the new line is terrible? The current line? If it's anything like that Miles ultimate line, then yeah, it's terrible. If they, what were they thinking? What was that? I was so into this video until I heard 
the Miles Ultimate line. And I was just like, you know, I turned it. I, I wanted to turn the video off. I'm not even going to lie to you guys. I want to turn the video off because I'm just like, come on. You had something so great and you just ruined it. Here it is. Here we go. We got to kill people off for shock value to bring people back in to read the comic and then, re you know, resurrect them, bring them back because why not? And oh, timelines and time periods and universes and Earth one, four, five, six. You know what I mean? It's like, what? Oh, man. Sometimes I can't with comic books. That's where they start to lose me, bro. That is where they start to lose me. You know what's great about Dragon Ball Z? I can just watch Dragon Ball Z, right? And they might go to a new planet, but guess what? It has what? An antagonist? <laughs> and maybe that antagonist is enslaving the people, threatening to blow up the planet, et cetera, et cetera. But guess what? <laughs> I know what's going to happen. Goku's going to... He's going to be the antagonist, all right? Because that's what Goku does. Now, there might be some baloney in between all that. Goku might be dead or whatever, and then he comes back to life and things like that. But it's not convoluted, all right? It, it all makes sense in a way. <laughs> it kind of makes sense, you know? Anyways, this was a really great watch, though. Alex did it yet again. Um was able to keep my attention on this ultimate Spider-Man for 30 minutes. Alex, you are amazing. I hope you really enjoy your new videos because let me tell you, they're all good. And that's from me, okay? I hope I hope that means something to you. But if you do watch this. But um, yeah, I had a good time with Ultimate Spider-Man. I feel like this is the line that I'm the most familiar with. Like this is pretty common to see nowadays. Like, I feel like a lot of the modern media takes a lot of inspiration from the ultimate line, like especially in the beginning there with him being a teenager and him knowing Mary Jane and Harry um, when they're young and them all being like childhood friends and et cetera, et cetera. The, you know, they try to kind of keep the uncle Ben thing in there for a while. Like they try to build up his character a little bit more nowadays. And the, you know, Aunt May being this really powerful person, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Most of the uh, villains, they try to build them up and make them feel realistic the best that they can, especially like in some of the movies and stuff. The Ultimate Spider-Man game is really good, by the way. I miss that game. I had it on Xbox like a long time ago. It was a fantastic game. I don't know how the fans receive it. I liked it when I was younger. I feel like a lot of the Spider-Man video games were fire, bro. Like, I wish I could play all of them because there's a lot that I missed. Like, I played all the movie games. I played Ultimate Spider-Man. But I never played, like, Web of Shadows, Shattered Dimensions, The Amazing Spider-Man 1 and 2. Um, I think there was another one called, like, Spider-Man Edge of Time. Dude, I, I should play those games. Like, low-key, I should find them, purchase them, and play them on the gaming channel. Would you guys watch that? Like, hey, 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 hey I'm coming up with ideas right now. Would you guys watch that? I also wanted to let you guys know that I will be checking out Spider-Verse, um, the first two movies or whatever, on the channel very soon for the first time. So if you want to see that, um, stay tuned, subscribe to the channel maybe, and uh, those should be, that, that, that video, the first video for Spider-Verse should be out in the next month or so. So stay tuned for that. But Ultimate Spider-Man, guys, it was looking good until the end of the video. <laughs> Until so that Miles Ultimate line and uh, things got a little shaky. Actually, they got very shaky. There was a whole earthquake, okay? <laughs> they pretty much ruined everything that I was happy about. I was like, Ultimate Spider-Man sounds amazing. I'm loving it. This is great. Miles came and I was like, okay, he's just a lot of the same thing. And that's great too, but he's black or he's mixed. And that's great. Puerto Rican and black. I can relate. You know what I mean? Like I'm biracial too, just like Miles. But then the Miles Ultimate line came out and I saw all the... The deaths and the resurrections and the earths and the universe things and the, oh yeah, turn it off. <laughs> I'll see you guys in the next one. Shouts out to Alex. All of their links will be in the description down below. I'll see you guys next time. Deuces. Hope will never die. Orale.